Peter, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> absolute honour. Absolute honour. Um, so, Peter, uh, we'd like to welcome you onto the Melbourne Uni Basketball website to talk about your career, um, basketball, life, and uh, maybe a little bit of involvement at Melbourne Uni somewhere along the way. Um, mate, basketball, how'd you get into it? Where, tell us where, where to begin. Interesting. Um, I, I started playing basketball in my first year at high school. Um, in those days, everybody played football or cricket and um, there wasn't much option for anything else. Um, so when I started high school, at Box Hill High School, I um, um, got into a into house football game. Um, and as a one of the taller year sevens, or first form as it was called in those days, and the um, played our game and then uh, 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 Form 1s and 2s played against each other. And afterwards, there was a Form 3 game, you know, 3 and 4, I think it was, and they didn't have a, a an umpire. And I was the tallest of the young kids, so they just grabbed me, put a whistle in my mouth and said, you're the umpire. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. Um, How old were you? I, sorry? How old were you in Form 1? 11. And um, I uh, gave somebody a free kick in the, in front of goal that everybody disagreed with. And yeah. so they, they all set upon me and beat me up. Um, the teacher who was supposed to be organising was sitting in his car reading the paper and didn't do anything about it. So I came home all bruised and bloodied um, and said, I'm not playing football anymore. Um, Box Hill High School at that time was one of the few schools that actually had a basketball ring and uh, offered basketball as an alternative sport. And uh, our garage mechanic was a guy by the name of Paul Wilkshire, who was a long time president of the Victorian Referees Association, the Basketball Referees Association. And he said to my dad, why don't, why doesn't Pete try basketball? So I did and tried out at, um, at school and in our house courts and um, played on an outdoor court, came home with gravel rashes all over my knees and uh, all of that. But I, even though I wasn't very good at it, I enjoyed it. And um, our garage man said, well, come down to Albert Park and you can play with my under 13 team in the uh, Church of England competition. So um, I went down, played, and started playing on a Saturday Saturday night down at Albert Park, the old Albert Park. And um, from there, I was selected in the Church of England combined team, started playing state championships. And uh, Ken Watson was my, my coach. When you say um, when you say Church of England, um, what was the affiliation with basketball at that point? Well, there was the Church of England Boys Society, the SEBS, and they actually ran the um, competition on the Saturday, and um, and that was the first team I started playing for, and then they had a representative team in the Victorian Championships on the Friday night which was church, originally Church of England, then became Church, and then became Church Tigers, and then became Melbourne Tigers. Who were you playing against at that time, and were these games all at Albert Park? Um, they were all at Albert Park, and just various other Church of England Boys Society teams from around Melbourne. Um, uh, I, I don't know, some of them, you know, they might have been from... Um, various just various different suburbs from around Melbourne that all come together at Albert Park because they were the only basketball courts around at the time. And so what were the names of some of the other teams, for example? Oh, good heavens, now you're stretching my, <laughs> my memory. <laughs> there was Ormond, um, I know, because we used to play them in the grand final quite often. Um, and they were from uh, Ormond Church of England. Um, but... Uh, I can't remember. Can't remember any of the others. 
And at this time, you're how old? Uh, 12, 11, 12. And uh, then, uh, as I said, I was um, uh, selected, um, well, it must have been 13 because I was selected in the representative team and there was no under 14 state championships in those days. Um, but it started with under 16. So I started playing under 16 um, uh, for um, Church of England, which today is called Melbourne Tigers. And then I was fortunate enough, probably because I was one of the taller boys on the team, um, I was fortunate enough to get selected in the under 16 state team. Um, we had a and we had a very good team. Our under 16 team was coached by Lindsay Gaze, and uh, um, we had quite a good team. We um, and ended up going through four years undefeated, un, under 16 two years and under 18 two years. And I remember the uh, our first under 16 grand final. I think we won it 89-11. So it was. Uh, we, we were a long way ahead of the opposition at that stage. Who were your and teammates? We, we had a very good coach. Uh, <laughs> Lindsay proved to be a very good choice of coach. <laughs> Did you have any uh, memorable teammates in those junior teams? Um, well, there's a few guys that I still sort of correspond with occasionally now. Um, uh, I, Mel Speed um, was on the team. He went on to be president of Basketball Australia and then he was CEO of uh, Cricket Australia and then he went to, I think the, um, I think he was, I'm not quite sure of the exact title, executive director or whatever of um, the International Cricket Association. And I think now he's involved with um, with rowing. But Mel and I played together as, as juniors. I uh, also played with Mel's brother, Ian, um, who's also in the IT business, um, and um, quite a few, quite a few other players. Do, um, do, do those guys, Mel and Ian, have any involvement with Melbourne Uni basketball? They did. Yeah, I think they after they finished with the Melbourne Tigers, um, I think they both played with Melbourne University. Certainly, Mel did, and I'm pretty sure Ian did as well. I recall some nicknames from our club newsletter of that era. Mm, we, uh, well, Ian, we used to call Tweed. So I don't know if that's if that nick, 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 nickname stayed on with him through through his Melbourne Uni career, um, and didn't really have a nick, nickname for for Mel that I can remember. Maybe he developed one later. Okay. Cool. And so this junior team was extremely successful under the tutelage of Lindsay Gaze. What next? Um, well, we then, um, I think at 16, I was also selected in the um, senior state team and was supposed to go to Adelaide to play in the Australian Senior Men's Championships. Um, unfortunately, I uh, broke my ankle and uh, about a week before the tournament and couldn't go at the end of the day, but um, yeah, we uh, also had a very good high school team. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think if there are any guys from our high school that would have played at Melbourne Uni. Um, uh, I think he's the juniors, perhaps. Um, anyway, we travelled around Australia and played other high schools, mainly in Sydney and Canberra and uh, ended up with a very good record on, on that area. And we, we said that we were the best high school team in Australia. There wasn't a, an actual championship as, as such in those days, but um, we decided we were the best so, because of the results we'd had against the best teams in Canberra and in, um, in Sydney. Um, yeah, and then... Um, I played with the Melbourne Tigers senior team um, and we did very well and then I was in 68 I was selected to on the Olympic team to go to Mexico how old were you at this point in time uh, in 68 I was 20 
So I'd started university. I was at university. I took um, 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 I did uh, after high school. Um, I was only sixteen when I finished VCE. Well, Box Hill. Sorry. From Box Hill. From Box Hill, and then uh, I got accepted into Monash, but I wanted to go to Melbourne and um, I didn't get into Melbourne because my results weren't, even though I'd passed, I, my results weren't good enough. So I thought, well, I'm young enough, so I did a, another year um, uh, uh, matriculation and ended up getting um, uh, honours in various subjects and was enough to get a Commonwealth scholarship and to get a place at Melbourne Uni. Nice. What, what, what was the matriculation? What did that mean? Well, that's the equivalent of VCE. Um, I think it's, it's an English college or university um, uh, term where where you uh, matriculate from. Um, uh, it's probably got Latin roots, I imagine. I did five years of Latin, but I can't remember that far back. <laughs> so, um, but it basically was allows you to take the next step you graduated or matriculated from high school and were able then to go on to university and and in terms of um the enrollment at melbourne university what course did you enroll in and what what motivated you to want to be there so badly um it was closer to the basketball stadium um i mean the <laughs> 17 at the time didn't have a, a driver's license um getting to monash i lived in blackburn um and getting to monash from there was pretty difficult in those days um and without a car so um, i was able to uh, you know get public transport into town and then get from Melbourne University down to Albert Park Basketball Stadium. How did you do that? On a tram and a bus or a bike? Yeah, a tram, tra uh, tr a bus to Box Hill Station, a train from Box Hill Station to the city, and a tram up to the university. Right. And at that time, so you'd enrolled in university, how much basketball were you playing? Like what, what level of practice were you putting in to be at uh, Melbourne Tigers, uh, at Melbourne Tigers standard in the senior team? Um, <clears throat> we had official training uh, three times a week, but I was probably doing about five times a week um, with other sort of unofficial training and some um, just general fitness training that we were doing. And... Um, the end of my first year at Melbourne Uni, um, I was doing uh, you know, sort of general science degree stuff, um, pure maths, applied maths, physics and chemistry. And uh, I, because I'd got honours in matriculation, um, I was in the honours course, so the, it was all a little bit more advanced than a, a standard course. And at the end of that first year, I think about three days after the final exams finished, we, um, the Melbourne Tigers went to the um, United States on our first basketball trip. It was the first time an Australian team had toured the, the US playing against colleges. And so all du during the exams, I was um, still training for that trip to the States. And... Um, wasn't giving perhaps as much attention to my studies as I should have. And for the first time in my life, I actually then failed um, uh, three of the four subjects, um, which was pretty um, uh, much an eye-opener for me. Um, I remember being in the United States and got a letter from the university with the results in it. And... Um, uh, so I had to write back and explain why they shouldn't throw me out, basically, uh, because I'd failed. And um, so I wrote a, a long letter from the US um, explaining why I thought I'd failed, because I was spending too much time 
playing basketball and um, concentrating on that rather than my studies. And two days after I got back from the US, I had to front up to the um, professorial board um, in, uh, at the university to explain myself. And so I walk into this, I, was, I don't know, 18 or whatever I was, how old I was at the time, I walk into this big room and there's um, sort of desks around and there's, I don't know, about 20 professors all sitting around looking rather stern and um, and, and everything. And the the guy in the, in the middle at the front who was obviously chairing the meeting asked me my name and, and he said, okay, and he looking through the results and he said, well, how many games did you win in the state? <laughs> <laughs> and that very much broke the ice. So <laughs> I was able to talk for a couple of minutes about um, about the trip to the states and um, <laughs> how, how how much fun it was and how much we learned and um, and we and and then they talked about my results and said well you did well at matriculation and we understand why and all this and anyway at the end of the day they gave me another, another chance and uh, I was allowed to um, repeat the three subjects I failed. Nice. Um, and, so, and that was a Melbourne Tigers senior team. What competition were you guys playing in at that time? Um, well, we were playing in the Victorian Championships um, at Albert Park, and we were also playing in what uh, was called the Southeastern Conference, which was a forerunner of today's NBL. And it was the teams from uh, Adelaide, Melbourne, um, uh, Canberra, Sydney, and Newcastle. Did you travel to play against those teams at their stadiums? Oh, yes. Um, oh, and Wollongong was there as well. Yeah, the best trip we had was um, we would fly to Sydney Friday afternoon, late Friday afternoon, because most of the guys were still working. Um, we would get to Sydney... Um, I don't know, it's seven o'clock, and there'd be an eight o'clock game at North Sydney against um, uh, Paratels. And the next, we'd stay somewhere in Sydney overnight, and the next morning we'd drive down to Wollongong, and we'd play in Wollongong on Sat. No, we'd drive, sorry, memory's playing tricks on me. We drove to Newcastle. We played in Newcastle on the Saturday night, and then. Uh, early Sunday morning, we drive from Newcastle back down to Sydney and then down to Wollongong. And we played against Wollongong on the Sunday afternoon. And then we had no time to have a shower or anything after the game. We had to get straight into the cars and back to Sydney Airport to catch the plane home. Wow. And this yeah. was at those stadiums. Uh, was that the Snake Pit? Um, or yeah. Wow. Yeah. Were there crowds that would attend, or was it more of a... No, it was pretty full. Um, uh, certainly, Sydney wasn't as full, but certainly Newcastle and Wollongong, the stadiums were full. They didn't hold that many people in those days, but certainly they were. Um, there were would have been, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 people there, which filled the stadium in those days. Incredible. And what year was this? Oh, this would have been... 67 through 70. Perhaps. And were there any Americans playing or like any imports, like paid Americans? Did you guys get paid? <laughs> um, occasionally I didn't have to pay to get into the stadium to, to play. Um, that was the amount of um, financial remuneration we received from from melbourne tigers although they did pay for the travel so we didn't have to pay for airfares or accommodation but um that was it um um there was uh, uh that was one of the reasons i ended up at um at melbourne university because i needed a job to um to put myself through um university and uh 
um, the coaching position for the Melbourne University women were, I think it paid about a thousand dollars a year. So uh, in those days, which was a lot of money for me in those days. And this thousand dollar a year job, did you take that up in first year of university while you were doing this MBL or this basketball no, league? No, I think I took it up. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I think I took it up in about third year. We'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so your Melbourne Tigers senior team representation, you weren't getting paid to play. Who were some of your teammates at that time? <clears throat> um, well, Lind in the early days, Lindsay Gaze, um, Billy Wyatt, <clears throat> both um, all the famous. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, um, uh, one of the first American to come out here. And, with there were two guys from Auburn University, um, one by the name of Fred Pretty Guy, and the other one was Tim Pearson. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> Freddie was. Oh yeah. Can we pause? Let's, Let's take a break. Second. Welcome back, Peter. Um, we were just talking about uh, your representation of the Melbourne Tigers and your first year at Melbourne University, and. Uh, I guess I was asking you about some of your teammates. We heard about some of your teammates and the Americans. Uh, you had Lindsay Gaze playing with you, which is pretty incredible considering he was your coach in under 16. And yep. um, you've gone off to this trip over to the States. Who did you guys play against over there and how'd you go? Um, well, we, we did miserably. We... <laughs> Uh, I think we won two games against small colleges. We played mainly on the uh, West Coast, and um, and we um, played mostly sort of mid-range colleges. We played against San Jose State. They had been on a tour to Australia the year before. Um, we played um, Oregon, Oregon State, um, most of the Pac-8. Um, and we played Washington, uh, Gonzaga, um, and various, uh, we played in Wyoming, we played um, Brigham Young in uh, Utah. Um, so we played against some very good schools and uh, mainly got our backsides kicked. Um, but it was an amazing learning experience um, uh, because I think the... Um, Last game we had before we left to go overseas, um, we played against a team called Montague um, from South Melbourne, and they they were playing first division. They they were down near the bottom, but they they were still a reasonable team, and we beat them by I don't know I can't remember exactly twenty twenty two points. And when we came back from the state um, after after losing to most of these college teams, we. I think we won two games. Um, but after losing to most of these poly teams, we came back and one of our first games was against Montague and we beat them by 45. Um, in, in, you know, because we got used to doing the little things that you needed to do to have any chance of success. And, uh, and so it was certainly um, a learning experience and I'm a firm believer that you try and play against the best you can play against because that's the way you're going to learn. Even if you don't win, you're still going to going to learn more playing against good players than you are against playing against mediocre teams. At that time, what was the <laughs> style of play? Did you guys play zone, man-on-man -man defense? Was there full-court trapping? Was there a lot of movement on offense? Like, how would you describe the style? Well, we firstly on offense, we, we ran the shuffle, of course. Um, which Ken Watson brought back from the States. He went uh, for six months uh, to Auburn University and was an assistant coach there for six months, and he brought the Auburn shuffle back. Um, and um, or variations of it. And um, it was very disciplined, and it, it's a five-man continuous offense everybody ends up playing in every position. And I think 
that was one of the reasons that we did reasonably well against some of those better teams because physically, you know, I played centre. I was six foot four. Um, and some of the centre players I played against, um, you know, the tallest one I played against was seven foot four. And his, his elbow came up to my nose or down to my nose, I should say. Um, but you, um, uh, you, you you learn more by playing against good players than you do against playing against not very good players. And I, I believe that I'm always, even in my coaching, I'm always uh, prefer to play against good teams than to play against weaker teams. Uh, um, because you learn more that way. And so in terms of um, offense, you guys were running first and thirds. What about defensively? Was there a three-point line to guard at this point in time? No, there was no three-point line, so we didn't have that issue. Um, we we ran mainly man defense, but we did run various types of zones. Um, at times, we ran full-court presses at times. Um, we didn't run them all the time, but um, we certainly uh, did use them and, and varied it. Um, we even ran matchup zones, which was fairly new and innovative in, in those days. And how would you describe the conditioning, factoring that you guys were not full-time athletes and you had jobs, etc.? Like, how deep would your team go into the bench? Well, how big was your rotation and like yeah how would you describe the conditioning compared to the modern day athlete circa 2020 um oh, almost non-existent um we our conditioning was was through playing basically um uh, there was some people ken played with ken cole um somebody talked about doing weights and ken said no we don't want to do weights that'll put our shooting off um, <laughs> you know, everybody does weights, but we didn't. Um, I, I did. I used to run a lot to try and get fit. So, in, in, uh, a couple of days a week, early in the morning, I'd run or, or at night. Um, and I remember Ken Watson was coaching the '68 team, and I'd been running about 10k a day. And uh, and in the middle of training, he told me I had to practice my running because I was too slow. Now, the thing was, I could have run all day, but not at the speed that he wanted me to. And, and of course, these days, um, practicing sprinting is, is just as important as any sort of long distance running that you might do. And um, I, I, that's something that I, I didn't understand it. I didn't know anything about it. I, I just thought I, I'd get fit by going out and running. So that's what I did. Um, but it, I still, still remember everybody laughing when he when he told me to pra- I had to practice my running because that's what I'd been doing, basically. That's... Probably more so than anybody else on the team. <laughs> that's the uh, second time you've mentioned the legendary Ken Watson. How would you describe your relationship with him and your introduction and how did that come about well ken was i think the the father of australian basketball pretty much um he i still he passed away a few years ago but um uh, i still see his uh his wife betty watson uh occasionally she's 95 i think now uh lives down at um uh, Aries Inlet, and um, I, I go down and visit her uh, occasionally, um, just to catch up and talk about all the old times, and, which is very good. She was president of the Women's um, Association. They were separate there for a long time, um, and Ken was secretary of the Victorian Basketball Association or the Victorian Amateur Basketball Association, as it was in those days. He must have been secretary for, I don't know, 30 years, um, a long time. And he was also on the board of um, Basketball Australia or, or Australian Basketball Association, as it was called in those days. And um, 
and he coached the 1956 Olympic team and he also coached the 68 Olympic team. Um, and uh, um, he was still in his 80s, was coaching under 14s, uh, Melbourne Tigers. And they won several national championships with him coaching, in, even though he was in his 80s at the time. So he's certainly um, been somebody who, and he was also involved with Lindsay in getting um, basketball stadiums built in Victoria. And as you probably know, there are more basketball stadiums around um, Victoria um, than any other than there are in any other state, and that's all as a result of Ken and Lindsay's work. And so when did you first meet Ken? Was he involved in your juniors at the Melbourne Tigers? Yeah, he was He was coaching the um, Church of England boys teams. Um, he was coaching one of the other teams and he was in charge of the whole competition, basically the whole Church of England competition. And then he, he and Lindsay then um, picked representative teams from those teams to compete in the um, Victorian Championship. Early on, when you were a junior player in your teenage years, you talk about the basketball stadium building that they instrumented. Were there many stadiums when you were a teacher, when you were a teenager in Melbourne? Where could you play basketball? You mentioned the gravel, asphalt, outdoor court at Box Hill. Was there an indoor stadium anywhere in the eastern suburbs? It wasn't gravel. It was actually asphalt, so it was quite an upmarket court at those days. Outdoor, no <laughs> but, doubt. Uh, I mean, these days you drive around and uh, look at schools and every school has a, a basketball rings and, and courts outdoors. Um, and a lot of them have indoor courts as well. The Box Hill High School now has two very nice indoor basketball courts which they didn't have when i was there and um <clears throat> uh, and lindsay and ken were involved in in getting money from the government from the councils and putting organizations together to uh, run these stadiums as money-making businesses so that they could survive and um and, and using that plan um, lots of two, three, four court stadiums went up and even bigger ones. I mean, there's, I think, 10 courts at Dandenong. There's, um, and I think there's 10 or 12 courts at Werribee and they've got plans to build another 10 courts. And We've got heaps, um, of, heaps of courts now. It's wonderful. But at, at that time, when you were a teenager, circa what year was this? The late 60s. Late yeah. 60s. How many, how many indoor courts were there outside... How many were there at Albert Park and how many were there elsewhere? When I started at Albert Park, they had six, um, six courts and four of them were concrete floors and two, court one and court two were wooden floors. Um, they then built two more courts down the back, seven and eight. They had wooden floors. And then later on, they put a court nine at the front of the building, uh, which also had a wooden floor. And then years later, they covered in courts um, three through six and put wooden floors on, on them. But originally, they were concrete floors. And elsewhere in Melbourne during the late 60s, were there any out... You had an outdoor court in Box Hill. Were there other outdoor courts and were there other indoor courts? Um, I can't remember any other outdoor courts. Um, there were a couple of church halls where people used to play basketball. Um, I remember one... Uh, we went and did an exhibition game um, down Gippsland and we played in this church hall and um, you couldn't shoot from the corners because there was a, a, um, a sort of seating uh, arrangement around the at that end of the court. Um, they had upstairs seating and um, that lowered the ceiling in, in the corners so you couldn't shoot from the corners. Also, the... Um, the uh, the the markings on the sides of the court were about fifteen inches up the wall, so <laughs> um, the ball was only out if it hit 
above that line, <laughs> um, the wall above that line. And if you had to do throw the ball in from the side, you, you had to stand there and put one foot on the wall above the line and then throw the ball in. <laughs> so it was... Um, I played in some interesting places. How how would you compare those to the facilities in the states when you went over on that first tour with the Melbourne Tigers? Ah, uh, I mean the stadiums that they had there was just just amazing. You know, at Oregon, Oregon State, and various other places. Um, there, you know, they had stadiums with fifteen, twenty thousand spectators, and uh, it was just amazing. It made us very jealous. Incredible. We also, that first trip, we also had an opportunity to play against UCLA. And uh, in those days, they had this um, uh, long, skinny center called Lou wow. Alcindor, who yeah. later became Kareem El Jabbar. <laughs> we were asked if we wanted to play against the UCLA team. And, um, and, and Ken Watson turned it down, unfortunately, because they were financially they weren't offering any incentives you know they weren't helping to pay for accommodation or or anything so we did because it was our money we would have had to go to uh Pauley pavilion and and you know pay for our own travel and accommodation and everything and um and we found other games that did pay us a little bit and i think also ken was worried about losing by you know 30 40 50 points or whatever but it would have been amazing to play against um um kareem i think even even in his young days i, I don't know peter but i seem to recall that when i was a, a kid in preston in west preston in the northern suburbs of melbourne did kareem come and visit at some point i thought i saw something about him visiting the tyler street stadium that i used to play at yeah, I think he did, but I was overseas at the time. But I can vaguely remember um, the fact that he was he, he was briefly in Australia, um, but I, I wasn't here at the time, so um, I can't remember it. No worries. So you got back from this stint in the States. Was there any concept of college scholarships from the US for Australians at this time? Yeah, we... We had some offers. I was offered a scholarship to Idaho State, um, a little town called Pocatello, Idaho. Um, and uh, But at the time, um, you know, the University of Idaho's reputation wasn't quite the same as Melbourne University's reputation. Um, and I was halfway through my degree at, um, at Melbourne and decided that um, I didn't really want to pull up roots and, and go and live in freezing Idaho for uh, a couple of years. And I felt also that with Lindsay coaching, um, I was probably getting as good a coaching experience as I would have gotten in, um, in, in, in college. Right. So, um, but there were a couple of offers, but nothing, not nobody, uh, one of the guys on the 68 team, Rod Wolf, he went to Oregon and studied at Oregon and played basketball there. And another guy, Carl Rodwall, um, who he'd been to college at University of California in Riverside. And he played there for four years as well. Would you consider them some of the earlier Australians to play in the NCAA system? Oh, yeah. Carl, Carl Rodwell, I think, was the first but i'm not sure if he was uh, there could have been others as well but most of them i think the early ones w would have gone more for the academic side of things than the basketball side of things what about eddie P pablowinskis how do you say his name? yeah he never saw a, a shot he didn't like um he yeah eddie played in he was a few years younger than me and he played in uh, munich um and was second top scorer at the olympics in munich in 72 and then he was top scorer at the olympics in montreal in 76. um he went to lsu um 
in in Louisiana and uh, played college basketball there. He went to junior college first, um, Rick's College in Idaho, I think it was, something like that, and then went for his final two years to LSU where I, somebody said that he'd beaten a couple of Pete Maravich's records, which is pretty impressive because Pete Maravich was one hell of a player. A pistol. Eddie has since written a 400 page book on how to shoot free throws um knowing eddie probably 200 pages of it are about him and the rest about his techniques he has held various foul shooting records one of them i think was quite impressive i think it was 17 foul shots in a row blindfolded which is pretty impressive I guess that's a bit of a tangent, and we'll get to the Olympic stuff in a bit, but Eddie retired, perhaps prematurely, after some of those performances, is that correct? Um, I don't know, I, because after the 72 Olympics, I stayed on in Germany, and I lost touch with Eddie and a, a lot of the other Australian basketballers at that stage because I was involved in basketball in Germany and, um, and, and was a little bit away. Communication wasn't anything then like it is today. You know, about, I think phone calls were about $5 a minute, and um, uh, which was a lot of money in those days. It's still a lot these days compared to the cost of a phone call to Germany. And um, the... I think an airmail letter would take, you know, seven or eight days to, to get between the two countries. So communication wasn't anywhere near like it is today. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, so, on, yeah. on that topic of communication, you guys have gone over to the US and played this college tour. I'm sure it was incredible. How much familiarity did you have with American basketball prior to that? Did Was there some concept of being able to watch game tape from professional American basketball as a junior? No. Short answer. Um, well, there was a um, magazine called Scholastic Coach, which handled... Um, it was a, a coaching magazine which handled basketball amongst other sports. And, and Ken and Linda used to give copies of that every month from mailed from the States. And uh, that would have various ideas in it about what they, you know, some new types of offense or, or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that was about it. Um, there wasn't much else at all. Um, we, had, um, we had a couple of basketball games were televised uh, in Melbourne because it was all black and white television in those days. Um, but they did televise a couple of games, but not very many. And um, there's nowhere near the uh, the following of the NBA, for example, that there is these, these days. So when you say they televised a couple of games, was that a couple of games a year or like once in a while? Who, who, who were playing? Well, a couple of games a year, basically. Um there would be an American team would come out and they would televise one of those games. Uh, they would play against a couple of different club teams, including us. Um, and because we were um, one of the better club teams, we often, our games were tele televised, but there still weren't that many. Maybe two or three a year would get televised and that's about it. And these are just games that had occurred in Australia. So you never... You probably never even saw any footage of American basketball. Um, there would be some sort of grainy Super 8 movies occasionally that people would get hold of, um, but uh, there wasn't a lot. Um, there was, certainly wasn't anywhere near the amount of, um, uh, of, of footage available that there is today. Even the Olympics? Even the Olympics. Uh, I've, I've seen a friend of mine in Germany took some tape, uh, taped the last few minutes of the 
famous final between the US and Russia, where Russia won for the first time. What year was that? Sorry? What year was that? 72. And um, they had to cheat to win, but the referees didn't call it. So, you know, the end result is that the gold, the US refused to accept the silver medal. So there's still silver medals locked up in at the um, IOC headquarters in Lausanne or wherever it is in Switzerland. Were you present for that game? Yeah, we were not quite courtside. I think I was about three rows back. So when you say the Russians cheated, what do you mean? Well, um, I don't know that they went out to actually say we're going to cheat and do this, but what happened, very short capsulated, encapsulated version, um, uh, the Americans, the game should never have been close, but it was because the Americans were playing slow down ball and... Um, the final score ended up being 52-51, I think. Um, the Americans got two free throws with seconds to go on the clock. Um, uh, Tom, um, Doug Collins hit both of them and put the US up by one point. Um, they then took the ball out at the end line and threw a long pass that went nowhere and the clock sounded and the game was over and the Americans felt that they'd won and were jumping up and down all excited. And um, William Jones, who was the president of FIBA, um, came out of the stand and said, no, no, the coach, the, the Russian coach wanted a timeout. You should have given him a timeout to put three seconds back on the clock and give him a timeout. And they said, no, no, the game's over. But the referees, because the president of the World Basketball Association told them, um, they recalled the game and gave the Russians a timeout and um, put three seconds back on the clock. So the Russians got the ball at the end line again and the Americans had been arguing and didn't get organised. Um, the... Russians threw a full court pass, but the guy throwing the ball in stepped over the end line. You can clearly see it in the film. Stepped over the end line to throw the full court pass, which should have been a violation. The Russian down the other end was one of their big guys, and he was guarded by two Americans. He basically knocked them both over, took the ball, travelled, did a layup, and they won the game. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, you know, the travel is all a matter of interpretation. Knocking the other two guys over is a matter of interpretation, I suppose. But putting his foot over the line to throw the long full court pass should not have been interpretation. It was a clear violation. What's your should, They should have repeated the last three seconds. They should never have awarded the Russians a, a, a timeout. What, what is your opinion of why all those transgressions occurred at the same time? Do you think the referees were turning a blind eye intentionally or do you think they didn't see that stuff? I wouldn't say that referees would turn a blind eye intentionally. That's not the right thing to do. I, I'd never, I'd never uh, accuse a referee of doing that. <laughs> Who, where were the referees from? Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember. They were probably Europe somewhere, I imagine. It could have been South America. Don't know. So how would you explain that foot violation not getting picked up? Well, maybe the referee just didn't see it. I, I, I don't know. But everyone else in the stadium saw it? Well, I don't know about everyone, but certainly a lot of people did. And it's very clear on the film too. Um, but anyway. Wow. That, you win some and you lose some, and yeah. life goes. On. Yeah, wow. Well, we'll get to the Olympics. Uh, that's an exciting little precursor. Wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, wonderful story there. So, let's let's break for a second, and um, I'll just record this. Welcome back, Peter. We were just talking about 
all sorts of uh, wonderful stories about the Olympics and the Americans and the Russians and Doug Collins. Mate, before that, we were talking about your university and your first year at University of Melbourne, where you had some struggles academically with that US tour. Um, and you alluded to the 68 Olympics. What, what happened after your first year of Melbourne University? Um, yeah, in 67, I repeated first year, the three subjects that I'd failed. And uh, 68 was going to be a full second year. However, the um, 68 Olympics were on and I'd set my sights on making the team. And um, the team would have returned to Australia, I think it was a week or so before the first lot of exams. And so I figured that wasn't a very smart thing to do um and so i was going to take a year off but i couldn't take a year off because in those days they had uh, conscription into the army and um if i'd have been had my birth date pulled out of the barrel um and i wasn't attending university i would have had to um, go into the army and that would have messed up a lot of things so I end up doing one subject part, uh, part time at Melbourne Uni, uh, second year of pure maths that was. And um, I taught uh, at high school, at Blackburn High School, uh, uh, four days a week and spent a lot of time training and uh, playing basketball, as you'd imagine. And then in 69, um, I went back and completed those subjects that I'd missed um, for second year. Um, uh, no, I basically repeated a full second year because after the conscription um, lottery, where, you know, I've never won a lottery in my life, so my, I was fortunate that my marble wasn't pulled out, my birth date wasn't pulled out, so I didn't have to go into the army, so I then dropped the one subject and I uh, just concentrated fully on, on my basketball. And that 68 Olympic campaign, how did the team get selected? Who are your teammates? Can you talk about the lead up for your preparation and what it was like? Yeah, um, the team was announced after the Australian Championships, which were up in Sydney. And we just won the final against um, South Australia. And um, they had a, a pause after, you know, a bit of a, the selectors had a meeting and uh, after the game was over, they had a ceremony and um, people were named on the Olympic team to go to Mexico. And um, my name was pulled out, which I was quite surprised and, well, not, I suppose, fully surprised. I, I, hoping that I would make the team and uh, um, and I was very pleased to hear my name called out. Um, there were uh, five Victorians, um, five, uh, so four South Australians, um, one from Canberra, one from Sydney um, and one from overseas, Carl Rodwell came from um, the United States. And uh, we had a one week training camp in Narrabeen, in just north of Sydney. Um, and Was there a stadium there? No, well, they had a basketball court. I wouldn't call it a stadium. An but indoor basketball a, court? Indoor basketball court, yes. Um, and we lived in the dormitory um, and then we took off to Mexico and then we got there, I think it was about four weeks before the Olympics. We then had to qualify because in those days there was no Oceana zone for Australia to qualify through. So um, we had to go to the qualifying tournament in Monterey and I remember we we were in Mexico City at the Olympic Village and um, they arranged for us to travel overnight by train from Mexico City to Monterey. 
and we asked the one of the guys asked the interpreter how long it would take and she said well it's normally about eight hours overnight unless the train gets held up by bank by train robbers <laughs> so, okay <laughs> fortunately we were not held up um so we got to monterey and there was a little bit of unrest in the team um some of the guys didn't want to and watson was the coach some of the guys didn't want to buy into the system we we're running we we're running the shuffle of course um and we um the dissension in the team um came out on the court and we ended up losing our qualification games against spain poland um and um there were two other teams i've forgotten who they were um so at the end of the day we did not qualify and came back to mexico uh, city um, after the qualifications and there was talk about whether we should be sent home or whether we should stay in the village and the decision was made that we would stay in the village and um, so we spent the time um relaxing a bit and spending all our time at the we played a few practice games against some of the other teams and spent our time during the olympics um uh, watching lots of basketball and also i'd become friends with uh, peter norman uh, in mexico because he was teaching as well and we met him uh, lindsay thompson who was minister of education at the time invited us in Pam Kilborn, um, uh, Peter Norman and myself into Government House for lunch. And uh, uh, and so I met um, Peter and then at the Olympics, um, before the Olympics, we played against um, San Jose State um, and one of their best players was a guy named S.T. Saffold, who was a roommate in college of the famous Tommy Smith. Um, who, uh, okay, Tommy Smith and John Carlos were both sprinters from San Jose. They were tipped to be first and second in the 200 metres uh, men's um, race. Peter Norman ended up splitting them. He came second and John Carlos came third. Tommy Smith um, won the race in world record time. And at the medal presentation ceremony, they did the black power sort. That's the one. And evidently it was Peter Norman who suggested to them, they only had one pair of black gloves. So Peter Norman suggested they wear one on their right hand and one of, one of them wears it on, on, on the other glove on his left hand. And if you look at the picture, the famous picture of them doing their black power solutions on the podium, um, you'll see that they're, one's a right-handed glove and the other one's a left-handed glove. <laughs> so I got to know Tommy Smith um, a little bit at the, at the village. I went up to speak to him and talk to him about ST because ST Saffold from the basketball team had stayed at our place uh, in Melbourne when they were here because um, in those days, visiting teams were billeted um, at homes uh, because we didn't have enough money to pay for hotels for visiting teams. So they were generally put up by um, the parents of the players, um, if you like. So, and this is when yeah, San, Jose State, San Jose State toured to play against the, the Melbourne Tigers, is that right? Um, sorry, you, your voice is not coming through very well that was the billeting occurred when that college team was at san jose state came to play against you at the melbourne tigers correct right and with the olympic team um we had a, 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 a four or five days training in melbourne as well and uh, we had to billet out the other players so the interstate players so they would we had um my parents put um billeted two of the other olympians and that sort of thing wouldn't happen these days of course what was your parents support like with regard to your basketball at this point and beforehand oh um they were pretty 
wrapped and they were right behind me. Um, my father ended up being a life member of the Referees Association. He got involved with refereeing and um, coaching referees. And um, my mother used to um, sit up in the stands with Margaret Gaze, Lindsay's wife, and um, they would knit and barrack for the Tigers. <laughs> so, and you could see them at just about every game. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, must have been... Um quite an experience to have Americans come over and stay with you, who you were, you know, college basketball players. I'm sure that would have been fun to hang out with them. Oh, yes. We, um, one of the interesting things was um, when ST Saffold was staying with us, he was a, um, a big um, uh, a Negro guy and really nice guy. And he stayed with us and my mother cooked dinner and had it and had dessert and for dessert we had um i think fruit salad and ice cream or something but in the fruit salad we had some passion fruit and he left all the passion fruit on the plate because he'd never seen passion fruit before and um thought it looked more like mouth droppings than <laughs> something you should be eating <laughs> he was a little bit concerned <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a really nice guy, and we, we had a great time. Oh, brilliant. And so that 68 campaign, you guys didn't qualify, but you were in the village. I mean, they talk about the Olympic Village these days as being, you know, party central once the athletes conclude their responsibilities. What was it like back then? Um, yeah, it was a bit like that. Um, but in those days, the women's village was physically separated from the men so the, the women were behind um a wire fence um you know an eight foot high wire fence and um and and so you didn't you saw them at the restaurants but you didn't there was no not as much socializing if you like we never saw any of the female athletes in our quarters and i'm sure there weren't any men in the female quarters <laughs> well i'm not sure maybe i wasn't sure i don't know <laughs> but it certainly wasn't um as common as it appears these days because my understanding is that they're not segregated like that anymore yeah i believe they go through more condoms during the olympic village uh part of the olympics <laughs> than any other part of the <laughs> <laughs> that's Anything. correct i've heard that too <laughs> um Right, so 68 Olympics, I guess it would have been pretty disappointing not to qualify. What happened after that? Um, well, we, I mean, we came back to Australia and life went on. Um, uh, yes, it was very disappointing and um, we certainly, there, um, that was after the 68 Olympics, the Oceana zone was created. The problem we had was that we, all the other teams could qualify through their zone, but um, we weren't in any zone, so we couldn't qualify through the Asian zone or through the European zone or the American zone. Um, they would each, each of those zones would have championships and the top teams would earn qualification to the Olympics. Um, we had no such possibility so the only way we could qualify was either by being the host which we were in 2000 or by um or by um winning the pre-olympic tournament which was open to all the teams that did not qualify by any other method so after 68 they created the ocean oceana zone and uh, we were then able to compete in the Oceana zone, mainly against just New Zealand, but sometimes some of the other team, other na smaller nations took part, but um, I think it's mainly been Australia and New Zealand. And we were able then to, by beating New Zealand, to then qualify in, to the 72 Olympics. Right. Yeah. So prior to the 72 Olympics, you came back to Australia from the 68 Olympics, did you go back to university at this time? 
Oh, yeah, so I had to finish my degree. Um, and um, and, and uh, I learnt the most, one of the most important things uh, around about that time. I, I, uh, I ever... Um, I learned how to pass exams at university, which is a, an art of its on its own. I think they don't actually teach that, but I did learn that, and um, and, and was able to successfully complete my degree. Um, and then I graduated in 1970. Went and got my first job, and I remember being really pleased by because on my first job was for three thousand six hundred dollars a year um, before tax so i don't know there's too many people around today who would take a, a job for a whole year for three thousand six hundred dollars well inflation's a real thing isn't it i mean back then so what year was that 70 how much would it have cost to purchase a house in the you know suburbs of Brunswick or you know Malvern well, or... I don't know about Brunswick or Malvern but I remember I think in about 71 or 72 looking at a four bedroom house in Doncaster a, a new house that was on sale for the exorbitant amount of $13,500 right so you could have bought that with four years worth of salary roughly yes <laughs> Well, it doesn't seem so bad, that $3,600 now. <laughs> uh, it's all relative, isn't it? It is relative. And so you've graduated. What? Where was that first job again? Um, my first job was for Consink Rio Tinto of Australia, um, a mining company. It's now called RTZ, um, Rio Tinto Zinc. And I was a programmer, and um, I got to uh, uh, write Fortran programs for um, uh, Rio um, to analyse their um, geological um, findings and work out where they should dig holes to take out iron ore and all of that sort of stuff. The original software engineering job. <laughs> um, yes. And... Around that time, was there any involvement with the coaching position for Melbourne University that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I, I took up the coaching job um, before I, um, uh, while well, I was still at university, and uh, I basically needed a job. I needed some money to help put myself through uni, um, because even though petrol was only, I think it was about 12 cents a litre, um, I still had to buy it. Um, and uh, and um, the job coaching I thought would fit in fairly well with my own basketball. Um, we the girls played in number in second division um, on court two on the old Albert Park Stadium, and I played on court one. And um, I had an assistant coach who would look after the team if if the games happened to be on at the same time. So you coached the girls. <laughs> Yep, and um, they had training in the bow repair centre in the old basketball court in the bow repair centre uh, Monday nights at seven o'clock, and it was always an effort to try and get into the guards on Tin Can Alley used to finish at seven o'clock, and I'd try and sneak in and 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 get in a little bit early if I could to get to training, but couple of times they wouldn't let me in and um, I had to wait there until seven o'clock before I could drive in and find a car park in inside the university. Avoid the ticket inspectors. <laughs> well that's right because outside the university the parking was then as it is today horrendous. It, it, it's always been horrendous and you mentioned Tin Can Ellie there I mean we know of Tin Ellie but what's the can about? Ah, uh, that's what that's what I used to call it. Um, it's the same one that runs along, you know, North Court and the Bow Repair Centre and etc. Yep. Who was coaching the Melbourne Uni men's team at that time? 
Um, I'm not sure. It could have been Timmy Pearson, I think. Were you playing for the Melbourne Uni men's team? No, no. Um, they were playing. They were playing in second division, and I was playing in first division. Um, so it would have been a, a step down for me, and probably would have been the end of my international career if I'd have um, done that. Um, but it did, in those days, disqualify me from playing in varsity uh, because I didn't play for the university on Wednesday night, so I wasn't allowed to play in varsity either. And there were quite a few players in that situation. Why um, did the players be required? Why were they required to play Wednesday nights, and what competition was that to play in varsity? Well, it was also Victorian Championships, but as I said, it was second division, and um, and those players wanted to play in varsity. Whereas if me and Ray Watson and a few other people who were students at the university um, who played for the Melbourne Tigers and other first division teams had been eligible, then several of those players probably wouldn't have made the team to go to in varsity. And you mentioned Ray Watson. There any relation to Ken? Number one son. Number one son. And Ray was a professor of statistics at Melbourne University for oh god, I don't know, forty years. He's retired a couple of years ago, oh. and uh, he was on the team to go to Mexico. With you. Yes. Uh, was Ray playing for the Olympic team before or after Mexico? No, Mexico was his only um, trip with the with the Olympic team. And you guys were both studying at Melbourne University, and you mentioned there might have been other first division professional ish players at the university at that time. Um, yeah, there was. Um... Um, Roger Bolton, there was um, Ian Speed, um, Mel Speed, um, uh, who I think later on went to play for university after they'd finished their careers with um, with the Melbourne Tigers. Right. So... Right. And so you guys were all playing first division in Wednesday nights. Was Is that the competition that subsequently became the VBA, the Victorian Basketball Association? Yes, in those days it used to be called Victorian Amateur Basketball Association. And then when Mel Speed became the president, he dropped the amateur bit, ah. which is fair enough. I mean, it was a sign of the times. I, I recall, I, as a an under-20s player for the Coburg Giants, I played the final season of VBA and I re recall playing against teams like Ballarat and uh, Hume or the, the Broadmeadows Broncos and it was a it was an incredibly high standard outside the NBL. Yeah, well, in, in those days a lot of players would come to Victoria to play in the, um, in, in the VABA number one division, or A grade as they called it. Um, because it was seen throughout Australia to be the top league, the top competition in, in Australia. And so that other competition you played in against South Australia and Sydney and Canberra and Wollongong, was that run on the weekends? Yes, that was just run on the weekends. And so would that play Saturday nights? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Depends. If there, if there were teams visiting, um, sometimes they'd visit Melbourne and then they'd play, they might play at another wedding on Friday night, they'd play us at Delbert Park on Saturday and they might play, I don't know, Reno or somebody on, on Sunday and then fly home. Reno? Who's Reno? Um, I think Reno ended up, I think they were originally from the Presbyterian Church, similarly to the Melbourne Tigers being from the Church of England. And um, they, I think, then mer end up merging with um, um, uh, Nutterwadding or Melbourne East to become the Nutterwadding Spectres. Barry right. Barnes was involved and he was 
also Australian coach for a while after Lindsay. Yeah, right. So, were there any other players from Melbourne Uni that you recall from firsts? Yeah, um, a guy by the name of LB Oaten, who played, he was a year or two ahead of me. Um, he uh, only played for the Melbourne, he, Melbourne Tigers, I think, for a year or two in seniors and then went and played with, he was doing a, an engineering degree at Melbourne and he... Uh, played for the Melbourne University Basketball Club for several years. And I, he was also on the, the men's committee, I think, um, to help um, organise the, uh, the club. And he and I were involved in um, rewriting several parts of the constitution at one stage. I expect that's the constitution that we probably still use, no doubt. Um, Maybe, I don't know, but it was certainly, it was from about 1970, I think we made all the changes and had a special general meeting to get them all passed. Beautiful. We'll have to have to get him on for a, an interview of his own at some point. And so you were coaching the Melbourne Uni women's team. And yes. tell, tell us about that. Um, well, it was uh, interesting. The... Uh, as I said, I, I needed the money and um, uh, it was a, a paying job, so um, uh, that made it nice. Um, it was my first coaching, proper coaching um, gig, and uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, um, it was a great bunch of girls, very, most of them were PE students, and um, we played in a couple of uh, inter-varsities. The first one was in New England, and my sister who was doing PE, studying PE at Melbourne. She, she was my starting centre player. Um, and New England. Yeah, Armidale and University of New England, or University of New South Wales in Armidale. I'm, I'm not sure what they call it, but that's where it was. Because uh, we had we flew up there on Rex, um, which was still a prop um, driven aeroplane. A propellers, huh? Yeah, and uh, we, which was quite interesting. And yeah, so we went up um, up there, and I was, you know, the the rooster amongst all the hens, if you like. Um, you know, and uh, <laughs> we we won the um, we won the final against Monash by a couple of points, and at the celebrations afterwards, the girls really surprised me because they also won the boat races. <laughs> uh, and um, for those who don't know, what's a boat race? <laughs> well, a boat race was is basically a, a beer drinking game, and uh, who can. Teams of four, and whoever uh, the first one has to scull their beer, and when they put it down, the next one starts, and the first team to finish wins. And I remember one of my girls um, uh, sitting on the floor afterwards, and when I congratulated her on winning, um, she looked at me and said, "But I don't even like beer." <laughs> 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 They had to do, you know, three or four races and there were a couple of reruns, of course, and Again, all of this, you know, the usual sort of stuff. I'm sure it hasn't changed much. Against two. Oh, I forget who they had to play off against in the final. No, but, against um, like other Melbourne University boat racing teams? Um, no, it was, it was just the girls basketball team against teams of girls from the other universities. Huh. And this was at the dinner after the grand final. And um, each university had to provide a, a team of four girls to um, to go and compete in the boat races. How did the girls' team come about? Were they well-practiced at basketball or, you know, how much familiarity did they have? Had they been, like, mostly playing as juniors? 
Um, well, in those days, there wasn't a big junior competition like there is these days. And, um, and most of my team were um, uh, phys ed students and they learnt basketball as part of their phys ed degree. Um, my sister had played quite a bit and she played number one division at Albert Park um, you know, with a few other girls who end up playing on the Australian team. So she played at quite a high level, but most of the others hadn't. And um, and we had one training a week, Monday night, seven o'clock in the old Bowery Pest Centre. And that was that was it. And then we played on Wednesdays. Um, I mean, one year we had a training camp down at Anglesey, which was a lot of fun and games. And we also did a little bit of basketball. <laughs> And uh, because we did it in together with the men's team, so uh, but um, it was a lot of good times had by all. At that time, how many how many members were there at Melbourne University Basketball Club? Oh, I have no idea. Probably, I think I think there was only one women's team, and there was probably two or maybe three men's teams. How many players per team? Seven or eight. And so the women's team were playing second division. How many divisions of women's basketball were there? Oh, um, I don't know, but probably Victorian Championships, probably five or six. So, um, and it was, um, no, probably wouldn't have even been that much, maybe only three or four because we... They used to play on court nine, court two, where we played. Court Division one was court nine. Division two was court two. And then I think court three and four. So there would have been four divisions. And that was the, the, the Wednesday night championships. Were there other nights or days that women played basketball at Albert Park? Well, there were, but I don't think the university was involved in any of them. But what was the... What was the other competitions that were available? Were there junior and senior comps? Um, yeah, there, there was limited juniors, um, but yes, there was a jun junior competition. It was, and as I said, it was nowhere near as popular then as it is today. Um, a lot of guys used to think um, that because in those days, netball used to be called basketball, and um, a lot of guys would, you know, try and rubbish rubbish us by saying you know asking do we wear skirts and all this sort of bullshit but apart from that um and that's because basketball from a, a women's perspective was netball and so guys would tease you like your your netball players that's right yeah but um mostly we were bigger than them so it didn't last <laughs> very long <laughs> And I remember, I remember after training, a few of us went to one of the pubs in South Melbourne, and um, we were there with um, Rick Longley, who's Luke Longley's dad of Chicago Bulls fame. Um, Rick played with us for a couple of years. He's six foot ten, and there are a couple of other guys about six six, and. Um, a couple of drunks sort of came up to us and said you know, gee, what's the weather like up there and, you know, all this and how tall are you guys? And so we, um, Rick sort of turned around and this guy was being really annoying and he asked him, this drunk guy asked him for about the fifth time what the weather was like up there and uh, Rick sort of turned around and sort of dribbled on him and said, it's raining. <laughs> dribbled some of his beer on him <laughs> and um, he left us alone after that <laughs> classic <laughs> a rising sun, sun story potentially do you remember the pub um yeah um i think it was the um, casa de manana up in um, the corner of st kilda road and park street <laughs> but um yeah 
a pub was a pub in those days and the public bar was the public bar. <laughs> we digress. So the women's, there was women's basketball at this time. It wasn't huge. You were coaching the women's team for Melbourne University. You guys had won the IV, the National Championship of the University for Australia. Mm-hmm. And yep. um, did you continue on coaching after that? Yeah, I, I coached um, uh, um, for a couple of years and we we won, the, I thought it was three originally, but um, in sort of gathering my thoughts here uh, uh, for this meeting, for this interview, I, uh, I think I realised there was probably only two, but they seemed to all merge into one. Um, one of them was, uh, the second one was run by Monash, so it was in Melbourne and uh, down at Albert Park. And we won that one as well. So we were fortunate. We had a, um, a fairly good team, mainly because of all the PE students that were, were studying PE at um, Melbourne University. Do you recall some of the ladies in the team, who they were? Yeah, Cheryl McKenna was one. I think she went on to be... Um, the CEO of the sports union um, later on. Um, uh, we had uh, Kay Edwards, um, my sister, Pat. Um, we had uh, Diane Patterson, who I think ended up le- leading an expedition down to Antarctica some years later. Um, so, yeah, we had quite a few um interesting people on the team it was it was good good a good group of girls we had a lot of fun incredible and what was the melbourne university basketball club like in terms of was there any social um, activities or structure or organization outside of you've mentioned monday night training for the girls wednesday night games annual tournaments uh at the intervarsity were there other social events not really. I, I can't really remember, but it was, I can't remember any. Um, I think there was a annual end of year presentation and that was about it um, that we had in those days. Because the club was a lot smaller, I think, then than uh, what it is now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you recall any other stories or anecdotes from that time with those girls and the club? Um, no, I remember the guys used to come and would train after us at the Bar Repair Centre on Mondays and they'd come in early to uh, sit around and, and watch all the girls train, but um, nothing unusual about that, I suppose. How long did you have for training? I think it was an hour and a half. I was pretty lucky I had the whole court for an hour and a half, <laughs> once a week. The bow repair is now a gym, I believe, and uh, I I remember seeing it when I first first arrived at Melbourne University. It seemed almost like the the rings were stuck to the walls. Like, was there any sideline at that time behind the behind the backboard? There there wasn't much of an end line, no. Um, um, But that's okay. We only used we didn't. There were intramural games were played there. Um, We had an intramural competition in those days that sort of came and went and came back again and then disappeared again. And so, um, but um, there was no uh, uh, other regular competition there. Yeah. And so you've coached these two IVs, I guess, the, the InterVarsity tournaments for the, for the women's team. Um, what was next? What was next for, for you, for Peter? Um, well, then I, I got a, a, a full-time job after graduating and that plus my basketball didn't really give me much time to continue coaching. Um, I then was selected to, well, firstly, I, I suppose on a, one of the trips to the US in 7071, um, uh, we, uh, went over to the US again with the Melbourne Tigers. And on the 5th of January, 1971, I busted my knee playing in Chicago. 
was um, shipped home in a plaster cast, sort of hip to ankle, um, because they weren't going to operate on me in Chicago because the medical costs in the US are absolutely horrendous. And they were then, and they still are. Um, I remember seeing the bill for my overnight stay in hospital and uh, um, it had, I think, four columns for health insurance one, health insurance two, health insurance three, and health insurance four, of their various contributions to the cost of the stay. Um, but so I had a fairly long re rehabilitation stage, which I used the swimming pool at the bar repair center a fair bit to um, start swimming to strengthen my knee. And um, then used the track outside to start running or jogging in a straight line to start with and eventually worked up to being around, able to run around corners and um, gradually worked on building my, my, my knee back to normal functioning. And then I was, again, fortunate enough to get selected for the 72 team. Um, went to Munich and of course Munich was the um, terrorist attack on the Olympics in Munich and we were you know only really meters away from that although we didn't really um, have a lot of knowledge about what was happening of course there were several couple of buildings between us and where the Israeli team was um, uh, staying and then after the after the games, I uh, um, was offered to uh, to play with Bayern Munich. <clears throat> back 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 to the Olympics for a moment there. So the seventy two Olympics, uh, you mentioned earlier that Australia had a qualifying through the Oceania zone um, for that one. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we played. Um, we went over to New Zealand and. We had three games against New Zealand um, in, in, I don't know when that was, 71. Um, and we won all three and therefore qualified for the Olympics. What was New Zealand basketball like at that time? Um, it was okay. Um, we didn't have it all our own way, but we, you know, we didn't blow out any of the games but we won I think all our games by you know 15 to 20 points um, which internationally is probably a decent margin but uh, it wasn't they were, they were probably at a you know would have if they'd have played in the Victorian championships they probably would have been you know middle of the road I suppose in the Victorian championships and what were their facilities like in New Zealand? I recall going to New Zealand in the mid '90s, where I couldn't find a basketball court. Yes, we had trouble too. <laughs> yeah, I mean the facilities were um, modest, shall we say? Um, but you know that they had maybe three or four hundred people at the games, and. Um, because it was something different for them. But basketball wasn't a big deal in, in, in New Zealand in those days. It's certainly much more so these days. Yeah. And so you guys qualified uh, and you're, you're into it. 72 Olympics. And 72 Olympics, tell us about that. What was what was that like? Um, well, of course, the highlight of the Olympics and is the opening ceremony. And because we were the basketball team were pretty much the tallest, um, we got to be in the front row of the Australian contingent um, and marching into this stadium with 100,000 people, which we were able to do in Mexico as well as in Munich. Um, it's a pretty incredible feeling and uh, something that I'll never forget. And uh, in actually in... Um, Munich, um, one of my close friends, um, his wife had come to the games and she was sitting in the stands and he actually saw her amongst the 100,000 spectators. So it was pretty interesting. Um, 
we did fairly well. We finished up uh, ninth in Munich, and uh, which was um, the best, equal best that Australia had ever done up until then. Um, Australia's done better since. We lost to Spain by a couple of points. We lost to Poland by, uh, by to Czechoslovakia by a couple. Uh, if we'd have won either of those, we would have, would have been in the top eight. Um, but hey, it wasn't to be. So that's the way that's the way it goes. You know? And this was the tournament. Did Pablowinskis uh, score well in this one? Was that the one? That's yeah. Eddie finished up the second top scorer. Um, my job was basically to set screens for him and make sure he was able to got free to shoot the ball. Um, uh, I wasn't expected to score many points, and um, and I excelled at that. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, so I remember one of the big guys in. I'd set a pretty tough screen on and flattened one of the Spaniards, a uh, little Spanish guard, and uh, the big centre player sort of lumbered down the court after me. and said, "You do that again, I kill you." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what was the standard of European basketball like uh, for the teams you were playing against these countries in in sixty eight and in seventy two? Well, in your warm ups, Europe sixty eight. Europe was um, probably probably the second strongest. Well, easily the second strongest zone. Um, America, you had the US way out in front, but. Um, um, then came the Europeans. It would have been, you know, especially the uh, East Bloc, the Yugoslavs, the Russians, the Croats, the etc. etc. Although they weren't around then, but Yugoslavia was, and the Russians were. Um, the Italians were tough. Spain was tough. So yeah, there was a, a lot of good European teams around. Did they have mm-hmm. professional players at that time? You guys are all working full time jobs and heading off to the Olympics during your break. What about them? Um, they, they they were all. I think they were all employed to um, to investigate new ways of training for basketball or something like that. By who? <laughs> By the state. So their their government for their countries would give them full time jobs playing basketball effectively. Well, that's a lot of them were like that, especially the Eastern Bloc, the the old um, communist bloc countries. And what was yeah. the what was the rationale for that from your in your perspective? Like, were they trying to establish international um, presence in terms of their sporting performance? Well, yeah, I mean, they they say that politics and sports shouldn't mix, but they do. And so if the Russian basketball team beats the American basketball team, that's a big, a big political um, uh, plus for the, for the Russians, for example. Uh, so their, their team, their teams, they were full-time basketball players. There's no questioning it. And it's the 72 Olympics. Like, how would you describe the skill and conditioning of some of those other countries, the Russians, for example? Um, well, way ahead of us, um, and they were also, uh, I think, on average, a lot bigger than us too. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, you know, they did all radical things like using weights and all that sort of stuff that um, we didn't do, and uh, we just weren't at that level at, at that stage. And in terms of the Olympics, this Spanish centers like had a crack at you in English. Was there a lot of... They all spoke English. There's some obviously better than others, but they all spoke English. Most of the... You mean the basketball players? Some of... Well, yeah. I mean, some of them were naturalised Americans. Yeah, they... um, Spain had two naturalised Americans. We had... um, We had two, for example, on our team too. Which guys was that? Uh, Perry Crossway and Ken James. Is Perry um, Perry Crosswhite being the Rocky, father of Rocky Crosswhite still in Australia? He married an Australian girl, and he still lives here. Um, Ken went back to the states after the Olympics and has remained in the US since then. Did Perry have a son, Ian Crosswhite, who played in the NBL? 
So it sure did. Yeah, right. He also had three daughters who played in the WNBL. Yeah, right. Huh. And so we had some Americans playing for us. How did that work in terms of um, naturalization? Like, I, I'm under the impression that we're now allowed to have one naturalized American for our national team. How did we have two? Well, because that rule of only having one, what didn't exist in those days. How many could you have? Twelve. Did any countries have 12 naturalized Americans? I don't think so. I don't know of any. But there was no rule, as long as you were a naturalised citizen of that country, you were able to compete. And uh, so, as to my knowledge, there were no limits on that. <clears throat> but at the 72 Olympics, you didn't face any teams with, like, you know, what would, what would be the most Americans on a, a, a non-American team? Um, could have been, well, the Spaniards had two. Uh, we had two. Um, I can't think of any of the other teams. Don't know. Yeah, right. And what was the style of the other teams like? I mean, you know, you, you see European footage, uh, old European footage of very finesse style game with shooting and, you know, protected species on offense and stuff like that. Did, did you guys get... What was the style like? Was it rough and tumble? Were there elbows? Like, what, were, what was the officiating promoting in terms of style um well they they didn't believe in uh offensive fouls i uh, remember one year we played in um madrid and it was my first time playing in, in europe and uh, with the uh, with melbourne tigers and and i was in the middle of the key and one of their guards drove to the basket and later I was told uh, it was my job to get out of his way. Well, I didn't know that at the time. So I stood there and he sort of slid down me, hit me, and I st st stood my ground and he sort of slid down me. The referees went crazy calling a foul on me and the fans went crazy. They wanted to kill me. And I said, well, I was just standing here. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> so it was um, interesting you know, different types of refereeing. Um, the Europeans were a bit more generous on traveling calls, for example, um, than, uh, than some of them, what we've been taught. Um, uh, it certainly helps if you're doing a layup to be able to get that extra step. And then of course, now they've made it legal with this zero step stuff that they've brought in. So they've probably just given in to what's been um, uh, the accepted way of doing things in many countries. Well, the zero but steps yeah, more, the, more the, the Europeans, the Eastern Europeans were a lot slower and um, sort of uh, um, more structured, if you like, whereas um, uh, the Western Europeans and the Americans were more free flowing. Um, they didn't just come down the court and set up their offense and then start screening people and knocking people over to get a free shot. They were a bit more free flowing. Um, so you had to adjust to the different styles. And at the Olympics, was it a little bit different again compared to European basketball? At the Olympics? Olympics? Um, well, it, it, it was such a mix because it would depend on the referees. And, it, you know, sometimes if you got, you know, African referees would call the game differently to Eastern European referees who would call it different to American referees, um, for example. So it, it just varied and, and you became very adept at, um, at adjusting yeah, to, to the way things were going and the way the opposition was playing and the way the referees were calling the game. So that 72 Olympics, you mentioned Doug Collins earlier as an American, were there any other memorable players from the Americans or other teams? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, uh, we, the Americans had um, Tom Burleson, who's seven foot four, who's the tallest person I've ever had to guard. Um, we had um, uh, Jim Brewer, who also played NBA. Um, 
Uh, they had a couple of others as well. Um, but they were, they were, I mean, and Doug Collins went on to coach in the NBA as well after he finished his playing days. Um, so they, they certainly had a very good team. They were coached by Hank Iber. It was his last Olympics. He'd coached the previous, I don't know how many Olympics. And he was an old school college coach. And they had so much talent on the team, but he wouldn't let them run. So he had all these um, racehorses and he was forever just pulling them back and they had to walk the ball up and set up their offense and go through, you know, and he, he wouldn't let them run. And it was only in the last couple of minutes of the grand final, um, the, the gold medal game, that they started to run a bit and ignored what he, what they'd been taught. I mean, they only beat us by, they beat us by about 20, I think, in, 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 during the, the Olympics. But um, they should have beaten us by a lot more. Uh, because of the talent they had. Why do you think they they were playing such a slow down style of game? Like, what do you think that that's Olympics? A, that's the way, that's the way the colleges play, and that's the way Hank Iber, who was the head coach, that's the way he'd been coaching for you know 150 years. Um, they had no 30 second clock in the college system, and so they just slow the game down, and and the 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 um. Uh, the focus was on not making a mistake rather than on trying to do something positive and maybe making a mistake, but so what, you'll get it next time. You know, do, do you think that loss to the, was it the Soviet Union or Russia? Soviet Union. Do you yeah. think that loss to the Soviet Union changed the style of college basketball afterwards? Well, it's changed the style of the American team. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about, uh, maybe did with colleges as well, because they also introduced a, a, a shot clock and um, uh, made a few other changes. But um, it's certainly from, you know, that was the deciding, that loss in that gold medal game was led to the change of, you know, the eventual um, emergence of the dream team and having professionals being allowed to play because in those days there were no NBA players in the US team either. Well, wasn't it college players in the American Olympic team all the way up to 92? Sorry? Didn't didn't the American Olympic team, the men's American basketball team consisted exclusively of college players all the way up until 92? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it was ninety two, and they had the, the first dream team. Yeah, um, but um, it, it was the the start of that was in Munich because the Americans had never lost a game in the Olympics up until that day. Yeah. So, um, and there was also a big thing about amateurism in those days because. Um, one of the concerns I had with taking the job at Melbourne University was that the payment might m classify me as a professional, which would mean that I wouldn't be able to compete in the Olympics. Really? Now, never eventuated, but it was a thought that went through my mind and was something I spoke to Lindsay about at the time. And he said, just don't publicise it, just don't tell people and you'll be fine, he reckons. And so... Was the 72 Olympics your last Olympics because you went professional in terms of basketball after that? Um, it was my last Olympics because I then lived in Germany and um, I didn't come back to Australia. But to even, if you, even, if you, even if you had come back, would you have been eligible? Um, well, it, it's, if, there's, if there's no judge and jury then yes, I would have been eligible. Um, if people had wanted to get nasty, um, they could have found my contract with Bayern Munich and and declared me a professional, but then they would have had to also declare the German national team as professional as well. Right. Yeah, interesting. And so, for example, the 76 Australian team, did that have our best players from Australia, like Melbourne Tigers players, etc., or was it non-Melbourne Tigers players? Oh, I, I forget who was on the 76 team. I, I'm 
because I wasn't involved. I know there were several Melbourne Tigers players on the team, um, but uh, there was Perry Crosswhite, there was Ian Watson, um, second son of Ken Watson. Um, there was uh, John Maddock um, and, and a few others uh, who were Melbourne Tigers players who were on the 76 team. But I guess what I'm asking is, were there players who were not selected on the on Australian Olympic teams because they were playing professionally? Because we had professional guys playing in the 80s. Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of. There was money being paid in those days, but it was never official. And as I said, if there's no judge and jury, then you don't worry about it. Yeah, right. And so there was, guy, there was an American guy called um, Willie Anderson who came out here to play. Big guy? Uh, um, no, he wasn't that big. Probably six four, something like that. Black, black guy. Um, he upset some people by running coaching clinics for kids and charging them to attend, and he was declared a professional. Which meant what? Well, it meant he couldn't play anymore. So he, he tried out playing with the AFL, um, played with, tried out with North Melbourne, I think it was, and then, um, and then went back to the States. Wait, so the Victorian basketball championships wouldn't accept any professional players. It was only amateurs. Is that, like, is that what you're saying? Um, officially, that's, that was the line. It was very blurred in those days. When did when did professionalism emerge in Victorian basketball or Australian basketball? Well, I think when Mel Speed took over as president of Basketball Victoria, he um, got rid of the amateur out of the v VABA, as it used to be called, Victorian Amateur Basketball Association, and he shortened it down to VBA. Um, and I think that was just a recognition of fact because a lot of the not all but a lot of the first division players by then were getting some compensation some remuneration they may not have been full-time um, but they were getting something what what year was that no oh, i don't know it happened after i left so would have been probably in mid 80s maybe early 80s Right. And then with regard to our Olympic team, when did professionals like Australian, you know, fully classified professionals, when were they allowed or not allowed? To, like, when was the cutoff for, for them getting selected? Well, I don't think in Australia, I don't think there was ever a decision made. You can't play because you took money to play for so-and-so. Um, I don't think there was ever a, a case where that was actually made. Um, but certainly, I, I, I know for a fact, even when I was playing, that some players were getting some money to, to play basketball. Yeah. I wasn't one of them, but <laughs> some people were. Yeah. But it was, it was, I mean, they weren't going to get rich out with it. You know, it was sort of classified as, you know, petrol money or whatever, you know, or, this, or they, the club would buy them a car, an old car or something like that, right? Right. So back to the '72 Olympics. What was the um, what was the team dynamic like? You know, you mentioned Eddie never saw a shot he didn't like. You were setting lots of screens. Who was coaching? Like, you know, were, were there any good stories off on or off the court? Um, well, Lindsay was coaching. Um, there was, I, I think, the team unity was um, quite good. Uh, there were 11 Victorians and one South Australian on the team, which some people got upset about. Um, uh, but Ken Cole wasn't selected. Werner Lynn wasn't selected. Some people felt they should have been selected, but they weren't selected on the basis of what happened in pretty much on what happened in Mexico and after Mexico. Um, and... I think the the whole um, unity of the team was quite good and we got on well with each other. 
Um, we ran the shuffle, of course, with Lindsay coaching, and most of us knew it pretty pretty well. Um, the other Victorians who, were, who didn't play for Melbourne had had been away with us uh, to the States on previous trips. And so they sort of knew the offense fairly well anyway, and having played against it for so many years as well. So, um, yeah, so there, there was good camaraderie on the team, I think. Yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what was the, um, like, you know, the off the court stuff, like the Olympic Village, did you guys have team meals? Were you hanging out with the rest of the Olympic team? Were you hanging out with teams from other countries? Um, not really, because we we're so focused on, on on the competition. We played nearly every day of the Olympic um, Games, and so we really didn't have much free time to go and do things. And uh, you'd see, you know, some of the swimmers or wrestlers or, or boxers or whatever who were at, you know had their event and were finished. They were celebrating and you could see that every now and then but basically we kept to ourselves because we were f focused on what we had to do and scouting like you know what was the did you have scouting on we'd other go, teams yeah you know, we'd go and watch other games and um we talk about what they saw and um we didn't have any film um there was nothing like that we had stats that we could look at but uh, there was no film available. Um, but we'd all go and watch the games and then sit around afterwards and discuss various things they did and you know who I was likely going to have to guard and who other people would likely have to guard and the sorts of things they might do and you know those sorts of things. But um, we didn't certainly didn't do any film sessions, which is very much a part of the game these days. Because those days we still had. Our, our film making equipment was super eight you know what was a super eight uh super eight was a little movie camera and you had no sound just black and white movies and you could had to play it on a reel to reel so you um have to uh, put it onto a, a reel of tape and then like the old tape recorders and, and play the play the video. Yeah, wonderful. Movie. <laughs> and so you got seen at the Olympics, I assume, because what happened? Uh, well, we'll get into what happened in a sec. But you, you were you stayed in Europe for a while after that. Yeah, um, my sort of general plan was to um travel around europe for a while go and work in london for a while and then come back home overland and maybe be away for 12 months well that 12 months turned into 16 years um and i met an american basketball player um in munich and so i went and stayed with him after the olympics after having a a fight with one of the guards trying to get my gear back out of the village. <laughs> um, Explain. The um, uh, the Olympic team left on a, I don't know what night it was, Sunday night or Monday night, whatever t day they left. And I'd arranged with management that I was going to stay one more night and then leave the village. And um, they had approved that. And... So the next morning, I, the canteen, the restaurant was closed. So I went out of the village to get some breakfast, came back in to pick up my stuff to leave. And the guard on the gate, because of the terrorist attack, got all jumpy and said, no, this ID you're flashing at me is false. It's um, you've, you, you've forged it. And I said, no, no. And we're having a tug of war with, with my ID card. And all of a sudden, his other hand goes to his hip and he pulls out this, I don't know what it was, Smith & Wesson or, or some sort of revolver and sticks it under my nose. And so I said, OK, you win. <laughs> um, I give up. I want to talk to your boss who can speak English. So eventually somebody came who spoke English 
I told him what happened. And so from the entrance to the village, they had two soldiers with submachine guns basically marched me back to our room, um, searched my two small sports bags um, before letting me carry them back to the um, exit and then waved me goodbye and said, don't come back. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't want to come back. <laughs> Okay. All right. So yeah. So then after that event, I um, went and stayed with this American guy and, uh, who who was there playing basketball professionally, and he said uh, Bayern Munich are looking for a a, a player for their uh, national league team. Do you want to try out? And I said, Oh yeah, may as well. So between visits to the Oktoberfest, which was on just after the Olympics finished, um, I went and tried out with the Bayern Munich. Um, and I tried out for their basketball team, not their soccer team. And um, and they offered me a contract. So for the first time, I was actually getting paid to play basketball. And I got 500 Deutschmarks and, a, uh, and an apartment. And... Um, wasn't enough to get rich on, but it was enough to live on in those days. And so I played and then at the end of the season, um, uh, I was going to travel a bit and they said, well, um, we're not going to pay you while you're traveling. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I left and went and played with an American all-star team up in Bremerhaven. Um, and one of the guys said, the team in Cologne is looking for a player. Do you want to come and try out? And I said, yeah, why not? And so I went to Cologne and tried out and I was offered a contract in Cologne as well, which got me a, um, an apartment and 500 Deutschmarks plus a, plus a car. So I was coming up in the world. And, um, yeah, so I played in Cologne for several years and, um, and that's what what um, divisions did these clubs pl compete at in Europe? Uh, playing, uh, we I played national league um, within Germany, but uh, the clubs I played for didn't didn't play in the European league at that stage. Was that the Bundesliga? Bundesliga, yeah. And did the like did anyone did everyone speak English or did you have to learn some German? How did how did your playing go? Uh, pretty much both. Um, my coach in in Munich was Romanian and he didn't speak very much English, but all the guys on the team, the German guys, spoke reasonable English because they all do about six or seven years of English at school and they all spoke reasonable English. So they were able to translate for me when I had problems. And during the day, I'd go and do German lessons um, to... Uh, you know, learn, learn German and become better at it. Were there any other Australians who had played in Europe prior to that? Um, no, I don't believe so. Certainly I don't know of any. I, I believe I was the first. The first Australian to play professionally in Europe? Yeah. And it was more or less by accident, if you like. I didn't go over there. I didn't have an agent and I didn't... Um, arrange it all before I left Australia. Um, nothing of that. I just turned up and tried out and was given a contract. Unbelievable. Did you have much of a role in the in the um, band team? Oh, I, I started. Um, was most uh, most games was their top scorer, so which was different from the role I'd played at the Melbourne Tigers because um, uh, there my job was more or less to set screens for people like Eddie um, Palavinskis to uh, to allow him to shoot. Um, I'd score around the around the basket at times, but I was certainly never relied upon to get, you know, to score lots of points. And the German League, what were the stadiums, the facilities, you know, the crowds like? How big? Um, 
Uh, well, it varied from city to city. Uh, most of the teams were from university towns, so a lot of the guys were playing to sort of augment their university studies. Um, uh, Munich had we played in the old Olympic Stadium, so that was you know twenty thousand people. Um, uh, I don't think the Bundesliga teams filled it very often, but that's where we played. Um, other stadiums were a lot smaller and a lot a lot more crowded. Uh, you'd get two thousand people in a fifteen hundred seat stadium. You know. Um, so it, it, it varied from town to town. Did they have media coverage? Was there TV, like televised or radio games? I've got a scrapbook full of cuttings from from uh, from my stay in Munich and, and Cologne. So uh, there, there was a fair bit. They, they didn't get much on TV. There was a bit on TV occasionally, but not a lot. Uh, but they certainly got newspaper um, coverage um, of all the games and who was doing what. And was there a Euro League at that time? And if so, like, what was the qualification process and how did you guys look at that? Um, I, don't, I don't think the Euro League existed then. Certainly none of, the, um, none of the German teams played in the Euro League at that time. Uh, they do today, but not then. Um, I think the competition was mainly um, the big teams then were Italy and uh, Spain and then the communist countries, so Russia and Yugoslavia. Um, Greece was also fairly good. So uh, that was where most of the action was and they probably played, but it wasn't official Euro League like it is these days. And so did you guys never play friendlies against them as Bayern Munich? Correct. What about what about when you went over to France to Cologne? No, Cologne's in Germany. Oh, oh okay, um, right. <laughs> um, on the Rhine and uh, near Dusseldorf, between Dusseldorf and Bonn, um, uh, same same deal. Um, we in those days, in fact, the Bundesliga was split into two divisions, north and south and um, along geographic lines and Cologne played in the Bundesliga North and Munich played in Bundesliga South. And then the winners of each of those divisions would play off for the title. Yeah, right. And how did you go in terms of uh, titles? Did you did you guys contend, any of your teams? No, we were, we were way down the list. We didn't, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't even come close to competing for a title um i mean the, the guys on my team in both of them they were basically students and uh, they um were playing just for fun really um and um we we managed they'd managed to get into first division but um, um it wasn't uh, they weren't up playing up you know near the top of the league at all how would you compare at that time Germany's basketball uh, setup compared to Australia in terms of facilities and professionalism? Like, were there basketball courts? Were were there administrators who were like filling these stadiums and turning profits? Um, the the basket the setup in Germany is different in that they have uh, clubs. So Bayern Munich, for example, is a sports club in Munich and it has a professional football team and it also has a professional basketball team and it has a professional volleyball team, um, men's and women. And it also has a big clubhouse with lots of members who do what they call Freizeit sport, which is basically they just come there and, and they train for athletics or they'd train for, they'd play outdoor bowls or they would, um, you know, whatever. And they would be a member of the club. And, and it, so it was the social thing to be a member of the club. And you might go to football games or, or whatever. I mean, I became a fan in Munich because part of the um, 
the advantage of playing basketball for Bayern Munich was that we used to get free tickets to all their European Cup games. So we'd get in to see them play against Ajax Amsterdam or play some of their European Cup games, as well as some of their Bundesliga games. But the, they have clubs, and each of the clubs have a department, which is basketball or is whatever. And so the club would have a hall, which might have some seating, and there would be volleyball lines on the court, there'd be basketball lines on the court, there'd be indoor football lines on the court, there would be handball lines on the court. So you have all these thousands of lines and you have to work out uh, the basketball court is yellow or is red or, or whatever and try not to get it confused with the badminton courts or the football markings or, or whatever. So they were multi-sport clubs rather than just single sport clubs, which they tend to be in Australia. Um, a bit like Melbourne Uni, I suppose, who has multi multiple sports under the sports union um and they would have one clubhouse and one lot of facilities and everybody would have to share that in terms of um the atmosphere and the spectators do you think they had a much of a basketball appreciation i mean you hear you hear about uh well i've been to games in greece before where the whole stadium's like a, a big cigarette and you hear of the the coins getting chucked on the court what was it like in germany did the fans know what was going on um yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, they uh, they didn't have they weren't allowed to smoke in indoors. Um, that didn't stop them outdoors though. But when I was there, they um, I have played in in Greece where um, there was like a, a fog, a haze in the stadium uh, from all the cigarette smoke. Um, I haven't had coins thrown at me, but um, uh, there have been other things thrown at me. Um, so, so do tell but not in Germany okay um, so all right so Germany uh, Cologne three seasons there after your season in Bayern Munich yeah I played um, um, with uh, two clubs there um, um, the first club was ASV Cologne which is basically an athletics um, club and um, when they at the end of the first season they got they got a new coach and he wanted a um, an American centre player uh, taller than me I was too short even though I played centre most of my life um, and so I went and played for another club in in Cologne that were playing um, in second division so I played second division there for a couple of years as well. What was the athleticism like? I mean, you know, you'd be clocking in at what, 6'4", did you say? Yep. Were you dunking? Were other players dunking? Was that a thing? Uh, it, it, was, it, it was nowhere near the amount of dunks that you... you most games, nobody dunked the ball at all. Um, there just wasn't that um, emphasis on the athleticism required to do that, uh, well, like there is today. And... Um, you know, we could dunk it in warm-ups, but, you know, nothing special and sort of just get it over the front of the rim is what we had to do. Um, and so nothing as spectacular as some of the, some of the people uh, today. And again, that, that comes back to the, you know, we didn't do weights, we didn't do any athletic training, um, all the sorts of things that the, people, the players do these days. So what were the exciting aspects of the style of the game you know were people trying to cross over and break angles or like uh step back three or like dunk on people or was it more just about scoring well, and defending three for most i think that they, they bought in the three-point line just after the 72 olympics and so my first two seasons i didn't have three-point lines um they uh um i, I suppose it, it wasn't as athletic and as fast as the game is today it was a bit more a bit slower and a bit more controlled um than what it is today um so and we didn't have the um the dribbling prowess either that you know people trying to 
break ankles and, and whatever else. And, and I, I still remember the first time I saw somebody drool behind their back and in a game. And I thought, that's ridiculous. Why would you want to do that? And, you know, that'll never catch on. And, you know, <laughs> all these sorts of things. And, of course, everybody in the under 10s, under 12s does it these days. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, three years in Cologne. What's next? Well, I then um, started coaching. And I coached the, um, the uh, and again, it was, I was offered um, uh, um, I forget exactly. I think it was about fifteen hundred Deutsche marks a month to coach the women's team. Why did you Why did you get this offer to coach? I mean, was your playing career over at this point? Were you still playing? My wife, my wife was playing, and their coach quit just before the start of the season, and they were looking for a new coach. And I wasn't enjoying a lot what I was doing, so I took up the job, and I played when I, I kept playing, um, but the coaching role had priority. So um, if there was a clash, then I would coach. Um, if there wasn't a clash, then I'd play and coach separately. And uh, because at that stage, I was getting very little money to play, to play, and I was getting a lot more to coach. So I decided, I'd, well, I'll coach when I can. And if I can't, if, I, if I'm not coaching, then I'll play. You mentioned your wife there. Sorry? You mentioned your wife there, Peter. Yeah, she was playing on the um, uh, women's team. And as I said, their coach quit just before the start of the season. And um, they were playing second division. And so we lost our first game um, and by a couple of points. And then I had two weeks to, before the start of the season when I took over and um, lost the first game and then won every game after that, including the re return game against the team we lost against. And we beat them by 24 or something on the return game. So we finished up on top of the ladder and uh, we got promoted into the Bundesliga in first division. And after that, we ended up being amongst the top three teams in the country incredible mm. and but you met your wife there how did that happen how did i meet her uh, yeah um i came back with the coach of uh of the the first year i was there came back with the coach from a game and she was standing there <laughs> and he knew her and introduced me and so the one thing led to another and I didn't realise I'd be coaching her at that stage because I'd always said that I would not have a relationship with any any female players that I'm coaching. And the first time I go against that, look what happened. <laughs> and so... <laughs> incredible. And so, uh, well, she, she's German, I take it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I coached the team and, we, as I said, we went from second division into first division in one season and then um, and then we were always... Um, I ended up getting the first Australian girl to come over and play professionally in Germany. Who was um, that? Uh, by a lady by the name of Helen Nugent, who was playing first division in Melbourne. And, um, and then had a few other uh, American girls playing with us as well. And uh, we ended up usually second or third in the country um, uh, in the years I was playing. Was Helen Nugent uh, the first Australian woman to play in Europe or just in Germany? No, she was. Um, I certainly don't know of any others. Um, Michelle Timms uh, wants to take that on it, but she didn't come around. She went and played in Munich, I think, at the end of the 80s. And Helen was playing for me in Cologne in uh, the late 70s. And Helen's Helen's background, what was her um, basketball, you know, formative stuff? 
Um, I think she'd, she'd played at state level and she was playing first division for um, Bill Palmer was the coach um, and he was the one who organised it all for me. Um, and he, she was playing, you know, first division um, women in Melbourne and uh, and fitted in very well with what we needed. Um, fairly not a good shooting guard is what we needed to sort of try and organise our offence. Helen Nugent, that sounds Vietnamese. No. Nugent, N-U-G-E-N-T. N- N- it's not N-Y. Ah, it's okay. N- N-U-G-E-N-T. Did she go on to have much of a career? Um, well, she stayed on in Germany for probably nearly as long as I did. Um, uh, she played and then coached in Germany for many years. Um, so she didn't come back to Australia to, to play. She's back in Australia now, but she didn't come back to play. And you mentioned, so you had three seasons playing in Cologne, is that correct? Yep. Um, and what years were those again? They were like 74 through... 74, 75, something like that. And then you coached for how long after that? Oh, too long. Um, I don't know, about 10 years, 12 years. Coached the junior national team for a couple of years, the European championships. The German team? Yeah. The women's, and, the women's national team? Yeah, the junior national team, under 20 yep. uh, national team. And, um, and I was vice president of the German Coaches Association for seven years as well with um, um, organising coaching clinics for German coaches. Because in those days, well, they still do, um, if you want to coach one of the higher league teams, you have to have a, uh, a coaching qualification from the Coaches Association. And you know, if you want to coach national Bundesliga these days, you have to have a level one coaching um, uh, qualification. And how did you find your way into those roles? Like I, you know, it seems pretty incredible as a, a foreigner who doesn't even have a, a first language in German to be to be doing that. Um, well, my German became pretty fluent um, after living there for so long, and I was running a software house for. Um, about 12 years as well um, and I worked for Ford of Europe um, in Germany um, so um, I was pretty fluent in the language and obviously had a, a fairly good background in basketball um, and uh, had been through the coaching um, uh, process for many years and part of my business was also running a training company i had a training company as well so we used to run um, computer courses in uh, in germany at the same at, as well so I had a lot of practice in teaching if you like stand-up teaching wow incredible I, I still do that today I, I still run courses for basketball victoria coach courses wow and so you're you're in Germany for a good long time, coaching. Play, first playing, then coaching. Uh, you're married, I take it. Yep. Uh, and well, now you're back in Australia. Like you know, what what happened? Um. Well, in I forget the actual date. Twenty eighth of April, I think it was nineteen eighty six. A little town in Russia blew up called Chernobyl. And the nuclear cloud came over Cologne, amongst other places. And uh, a friend of mine, um, his neighbour, bought home a Geiger counter and ran it over the front lawn and said, that's interesting, with readings like that, when I cut the grass, I'll have to declare the clippings as nuclear waste. And so you think, you know, we've been looking for a, we, we've said, you know, we'll go back and live in Australia one day. Um, so that was sort of the catalyst that um, made us sell the business, sell the house and move back here. Plus, you know, they said things like, 
small children you can eat salad again but small children pregnant women shouldn't and my wife was five months pregnant with our first at the time so that was the reason why we packed everything up and sold everything and moved back in wow wow incredible and throughout your period your time in europe you were there for a good long time were there trips back to australia like were you involved with australian basketball at all um yes and no there yes there were trips back um but they but basically were just for a couple of weeks and i would you know go down the stadium and catch up with Lindsay and a few other people but um apart from that didn't really have an involvement with australian basketball um when we moved back here i coached um we had a, a daughter and a son so i've coached i coached them both when they were growing up as fathers tend to do and um i've been involved in coach training for some years now for basketball victoria and that's about the limit of it so incredible hopefully we can get you down to run some clinics at melbourne uni at some point happy to do so if you'd like me to do that absolutely uh, have to be um after the virus has gone has gone away yeah the coronavirus it's uh <laughs> mm. oh that, that's that's absolutely incredible peter like uh quite a lot of stories quite a lot of history in there man makes me feel very old <laughs> you, don't, you don't look very old you <laughs> well thank you but i'm 72 at the moment so do, do you do you look back on it do you look back on your time and like how do you how do you perceive your your achievements and you know the things that you did in in basketball up until now like you know do you, like how do you reflect on it um I, i'm thankful for the, the life I've had. I mean, basketball's given me uh, a heck of a lot, um, mainly friendships around the world. Um, I've still people in the States in, in Europe that I correspond with, or we talk on the on um, places like this on, on Skype or on whatever. Um, and so I still keep in touch with a lot of friends I made through basketball. And, it's, I've been really thankful for the um, um, for what it's given me. So, um, I think I've been pretty lucky. Wow, incredible. Well, Peter, thank you again. Like, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure this will serve as a, a wonderful historical record for you know for for Australian basketball, the first Australian to play professionally in Europe, and. Uh, yeah, the, the Olympics, and man, incredible. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure. It's been good fun trying, trying to remember all the things that happened. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all the best, mate. See ya. All right, thanks, Jason.